House of Blood was one of Scotland's most infamous and horrifying crime scenes well ever. When police entered, there was blood lining every single wall, ceiling, and there were pools of it on the ground. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the massacre that took place behind those four walls in the House of Blood. <laughs> So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case, but before we get into it, I do just want to thank our sponsors for making this video possible, Magellan TV. Magellan TV, do I even need to say it? I feel like I do at this point. It's my favourite documentary streaming service. Who got it right? 10 points to you. Magellan TV is perfect for true crime junkies like me and you that feel like we've watched every true crime documentary in existence because they have so many cases from all over the world that I can guarantee there is at least one that you've never heard of. And they also add between 15 and 20 hours of content every single week. So there is no way you're ever gonna get bored with Magellan TV. One of the new releases that I watched recently and I really recommend to you guys, if you're into the Jack the Ripper case, watch Jack the Ripper, the German suspect. It's, well, exactly what it sounds like. They're talking about this new suspect in the Jack the Ripper case. This documentary looks into the theory that Jack the Ripper could have been a German sailor, which I think is so interesting. Every time I hear about a new Jack the Ripper theory, I'm like, gimme, gimme. So if you guys are into all those theories and stuff like I am, I recommend this one a thousand times. Magellan TV is completely ad free and you can watch it on pretty much any device that you own. So what are you waiting for? And right now, when you buy one gift card for an annual membership, you'll get another one completely free when you go through my link, which is down below in the description. That's two Christmas presents ticked off. Or like, if you want to keep one for yourself, then that's your own Christmas present ticked off, I suppose. And someone else's. But yeah, thanks again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. Now, before I get into it, I do just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. Just a couple of content warnings before we get into this one. There will be themes of domestic abuse and violence violence, domestic violence, and also a mention of rape, although no rape actually takes place in this case. So if any of that is something that you feel like you can't watch right now, you know yourself better than anyone. Please do click out, look after yourself. I'm sure I can see you again a different time with a different case. But with all that being said, let's just get into the story. So today's case takes place in Glasgow, Scotland in 2004, which fun fact, that's actually not Fun at all, it's actually the complete opposite. I don't know why I said that. Glasgow actually used to be named the murder capital of Europe at one point in time, which is crazy. And Belfast Island is actually not that far behind it in terms of like one of the worst European cities in terms of murder. Um, but anyway, murderous geography lesson over. This case starts out in 1968 in Glasgow where Edith McAllendon was born. Not much is known about Edith's childhood or her upbringing other than the fact that she was raised in Glasgow. And we don't start to learn more about Edith and her life until she actually turned 18 because that was when she fell pregnant with her first ever child and she ended up giving birth to a son named John. And supposedly Edith was a very brilliant, devoted mother. She was very caring. She was there for her son. She tried absolutely everything that she could to provide for him, although money was such a problem for Edith. Some nights she couldn't afford to feed both of them, both her and her son, and in very, very desperate times, Edith turned to theft and prostitution as a means to make ends meet. This did get her into trouble with the police quite a lot. I mean, she was caught for her theft time and time again. She wasn't really good at getting away with it, but I mean, she wasn't trying to be a career criminal. She was just trying to provide for her son. So yeah, she was convicted. She was in and out of jail a few times. And I don't actually know where her son would go when she was in jail, because as far as I'm aware, she didn't have much family, like parents or anything to, give him to her. But every time she would be released, Edith would find herself homeless with her infant son 
The two of them would often have to sleep on the streets if they didn't make enough money to get into a hostel or a homeless shelter. Eventually, Edith did create like a bit of a support network around her of friends and family who would always either give her the money for a homeless shelter if she needed it or like offer their sofa for her to sleep on. Eventually, she just had that security. It wasn't the best security at all because she didn't have her own place, but at least she had the security that she could find somewhere to sleep, you know, they weren't gonna be on the streets. Still such an awful situation for a mother to find herself and her infant son in. And it was around this time when Edith was bouncing from shelter to shelter that she met a man named David Gillespie. He too was homeless and bouncing from shelter to shelter. He and Edith had a lot in common. They struck up a conversation and they actually got on like a house on fire. They made each other laugh, they understood each other more than anyone else could ever understand them and they just felt this real connection with each other. They felt a real bond from the second they met. They became really good friends and then quickly began dating. And this kind of put them in more of a family unit. Not that David Gillespie was by any means like a stepdad to John, because he wasn't, but it just kind of gave them a bit more of a unit, you know? Which when you're homeless and traveling from shelter to shelter and stuff like that, you need, you need family. You need, you know, a bit of a, a group, a pack. And so that's what they had and they were happy. You know, they had this little like family, I suppose. It just made their situation a lot easier to handle now. They had company, they had added security of like, you know, always making sure they had at least some money for food because if they didn't have enough, maybe David would. Overall, they were just all a little bit happier now that they were together. And Edith and David very quickly made two more friends along the way, 67 year old Ian Mitchell and 71 year old Anthony Coyle. Now these two men were much older than Edith and David were and the two of them had been friends for decades now. They went way back. Ian and Anthony were both retired. They were both single from previous divorces and so when they did split up from their wives they were just like well should we just like move in together it'd make it cheaper we'd have a friend they just decided to be roommates in their retirement and so Ian bought this flat and he decided to rent out one of the bedrooms to Anthony and this apartment was essentially like the group's social hub this was like their meetup place this was where most of the stuff they did took place, I suppose. So now Edith's got a boyfriend. She's got a friendship group for herself. Things are really starting to look up. That was until she got herself in trouble with the law again. In January of 2004, when Edith McAllendon was 36 years old, she was found guilty of a very serious assault charge. Now, I wish I knew the details of this. I wish I could tell you what happened, but I don't know. I couldn't find any information online about it, although it must have been a very serious assault because she was actually sentenced to nine months in prison. And during that nine months that Edith was serving, David Gillespie, her boyfriend, actually started to get his life on track a little bit now that he didn't have her. He was 42 years old now. He got himself like a permanent place to stay. He signed a long-term let on one of the rooms at the Alexander Thompson Hotel in Glasgow Town Centre. And so he had an address now. He was no longer homeless. And this was one of the best things David ever did for himself because now it allowed him to do so much more on top of that. You know, go out and meet people, get a job. He was starting to gain back some independence. He was really starting to get like a normal life back. And then on October 16th, 2004, his girlfriend, Edith McAllendon, was about to be released from jail that exact day. Before she left the jail, she called him on one of the phones and just kind of asked where he was gonna be. She was so excited to go and see him. He told Edith that he was round at Ian and Anthony's apartment and they were all just having a drink and she should come and meet them and they should have like a celebratory drink. And she was like, yeah, let's do it. She was really excited. So she's released from jail. She goes down to this apartment and by the time she gets there, all three men are already very, very drunk. They were all very, heavy drinkers. And so Edith starts joining in. She's knocking back drinks, trying to catch up to the men. And her first day out of jail is going really well by their usual standards. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that they really enjoyed doing. So she was having a great day. But then after a few hours, the group actually ran out of alcohol and none of them wanted to be the one to go and get it from the shop. 
stop because they all struggled financially, all four of these people. So no one wanted to be the person to pay for the drinks. No one was volunteering to go to the shop. So they were all just sat there waiting until someone did. And it was at this point that Edith started to get like a bit angry and upset with her friends for this. She was like, guys, come on. I've just been let out of jail for the first time in nine months. Why will no one celebrate with me? Obviously she had been behind bars for nine months, so she'd had no money. She had no way of making money that whole time. So she had nothing to spend anywhere. She was just like, guys, come on, can't someone take one for the team and just buy the drinks? But all of the men just started getting defensive. Like, no, we bought the first round of drinks earlier before you even got here. So why should we buy the second round as well? They were saying like, oh, it's someone else's turn to pay now. I'm not paying twice in a row. And as this argument's going on, Edith is getting more and more upset and angry by the second. She felt really offended by this, that her friends wouldn't even just put down a little bit of money for her welcome back party. She felt as though her friends didn't care about this. And so she starts arguing with them. She starts screaming at them, in fact. She's only getting louder and more frantic as this argument's going on. And then all of a sudden, she turned her head and saw a knife laying on the kitchen counter. Edith didn't even take a second to think before she launched forward, grabbed the knife off of the counter and turned to her boyfriend, David Gillespie. Without saying a word, Edith brought the knife down and stabbed into David's thigh over and over and over again. It turned out she completely severed his femoral vein and because he'd been drinking all day, his blood had thinned dramatically. And so he was losing blood at an alarming rate. Eventually when Edith stopped stabbing her boyfriend's leg, she looked up at Ian and Anthony who just looked terrified. They were white as a ghost. They couldn't believe what had just happened. And immediately all of them knew how serious this was as well. They saw where Edith had stabbed and how much blood he was losing. They all knew that David could die from these injuries. Ian and Anthony just jumped up and started running around the apartment trying to find anything that they could to be able to stem the bleeding, you know, grabbing towels and everything. And it seemed that by now, Edith had snapped out of whatever rage she'd just been in and she also realized just how serious this was. She told the men that she was gonna run into the next room, grab her phone and call for help. And so they're thinking, okay, great, an ambulance is gonna be here to save him soon. But that wasn't gonna be the case because when Edith McCallendon said that she was gonna call for help, she didn't mean an ambulance because she was actually scared that she was gonna go to prison for what she'd just done. Obviously, I mean, yes, people do go to prison for stabbing someone like that. She knew that there was gonna be big consequences for what she'd just done. And so there was no way she was gonna call anyone like law enforcement, ambulance, anyone. And so instead she just called her son, John, who was now 17 years old and she asked him to come and help her. I don't really know what her plan was at this point in time. I don't think she had a plan. I think she just panicked. She knew she couldn't call an ambulance or police or anything like that. So she just wanted her son there. But either way, John got straight in a taxi and came straight down to the apartment. And when he arrived, he actually wasn't alone. He'd brought one of his school friends, 16 year old Jamie Gray. When John and Jamie arrived, supposedly everyone that was still in the apartment was still arguing, still fighting. And their arrival only made these arguments worse. Because Ian and Anthony were absolutely furious that Edith McAllendon, instead of calling the ambulance, to save her boyfriend's life, she'd called her teenage son and his friend. What were they gonna do to save David Gillespie's life? Absolutely nothing. But to make matters even worse, when John and Jamie had jumped in a taxi across Glasgow to get here, they hadn't actually had the money to pay for that taxi. So they hadn't, they'd just got out of the car and left. Which obviously left a very angry taxi driver out on the street demanding his money, as he should. So this taxi driver was causing a scene out on the street, like beeping his horn, shouting, screaming. So everyone in the apartment was like, shit, we need to go downstairs, talk to him, try and like smooth this out. We can't like draw attention to the situation right now. So they all left the apartment, left David Gillespie, bleeding out on the floor in the apartment 
and they all went downstairs to go and argue with this taxi driver. Again, none of them wanted to be the one to pay for this taxi. Edith was saying she had no money, John and Jamie were saying they had no money, and so eventually Ian Mitchell had to be the one to pay the taxi fare because, you know, he did actually try and argue quite a bit. He tried to be stubborn and not pay it. And then at some point during this, he remembered that his friend was dying upstairs and that, yeah, he probably should just pay it. I know that this group struggled financially a lot, but when your friend is dying upstairs, why did this argument even happen in the first place? Someone just pay. On the way back up to the apartment, Ian was complaining about the fact that he just had to pay this taxi fare the whole time. Like he was not gonna drop this. He was not gonna let him forget that he was not happy about this. And it was on this walk back up to the apartment that Ian and Anthony realized that an ambulance was never gonna come, was it? They were just now realizing that Edith had only called her son. She hadn't called her son and an ambulance they had no help on the way right now. So they all realized how serious this situation was. They'd left David Gillespie in the apartment bleeding out and there is no help on the way. So they all started running back to the apartment and when they got there, it was too late. David Gillespie had already died while they'd all been down arguing about who was paying the taxi fare. So John and Jamie immediately just start freaking out because remember, this is their first impression of the situation as well. This is the first time they've stepped foot in that apartment. They'd literally only just got out of the taxi outside. So they didn't even know that David Gillespie was stabbed. When Edith had rang them up and asked her son for some help, that's literally all she'd said, that she just needs some help. She didn't describe what she needed help with and her son had no idea that it was a stabbing. They could not believe what they had just walked into. But John, 17 year old John, the older of the two boys, he had a lot more of a calm head about this and he very calmly pulled his mother to the side and said, right, what are we gonna do about this? Because we need to do something, you're a murderer now. He said to her, look, you just got out of prison this morning for a nine month sentence. If they find out that you have murdered someone, you're gonna be in prison for the rest of your life. So you need to figure out how you're gonna hide this body and how you're gonna get away with this. He then pointed out to his mother that those two men, Ian and Anthony, had seen her do it, had been witnesses to the murder. And you know, David was their friend, so if police ask, of course they're gonna tell them what happened. Edith understood what her son was trying to say with this. She knew that something had to be done about Ian and Anthony. So the three of them, Edith, John and Jamie, all hatched a plan to murder them as well. They decided not to think too much about it. They weren't even gonna create a plan because right now they knew that they had both of those men in that apartment outnumbered as well. There was three of them and only two of those old men and they were quite elderly. They were in their late 60s, early 70s. So Edith, John and Jamie knew that it would be so easy for them to overpower those two men. Just don't say a word and attack out of nowhere. And that's exactly what they did because by now, Ian and Anthony were very unsuspecting. I mean, they were just sat on the sofas next to each other talking about what had just happened, about what they were gonna do about their dead friend. Of course, they weren't expecting more murders to happen beyond this point, and so their guard was down. And so 17-year-old John McAllendon decided that he was gonna make the first move. He walked into the kitchen, grabbed a knife, and then went and sat next to Ian Mitchell on the sofa. Literally within a split second of him sitting down on that sofa, he didn't even give himself time to think about it. He launched himself over and started stabbing Ian in the chest over and over and over. As soon as Anthony, who was sat on the other sofa, as soon as he saw this, he jumped up and ran straight into one of the bedrooms, as far away from this as he could get. He ran into this bedroom, locked the door behind him, he barricaded the door, really tried to protect himself as much as he could. But at this point, the group didn't really care about Anthony. They were way too focused on Ian. Besides, they knew that Anthony couldn't really get anywhere. He's in a locked bedroom. So they were just gonna focus on Ian for now and Anthony was still gonna be there when they were ready for him, I suppose. By now, John had already stabbed Ian so many times that he'd stopped moving. He probably was already dead. But just to make sure, all three of them, Edith, John and Jamie, all decided to take turns kicking Ian in the head 
to make sure that he was dead. When they were finally done, Edith then suggested going and finding Anthony, but John wasn't convinced that Ian was actually dead. I don't know how he wasn't convinced because his skull was literally open. You will hear when we go through the crime scene evidence later, he was very clearly dead. But John wasn't convinced. He thought that maybe him or David Gillespie could be pretending to be dead. Or maybe they're just knocked out, unconscious, passed out. So he came up with a plan to make sure that these two men were actually dead and that they weren't just playing dead. He went over to the kitchen, boiled the kettle, waited until the water was boiling hot and then took it over and poured it over these two men's heads. He said that there was absolutely no way that if these two men were actually alive, there would be no way that they could sit and get scalded by this boiling hot water without flinching. And that was how they were gonna tell if they were alive or dead. But when he poured the water over both their heads, nothing, that of course they were already dead. And so now attention switch to Anthony Coyle, who has locked himself in one of the back bedrooms. The group knew exactly where he was and how to get to him. Well, actually that wasn't gonna be that easy because like I said, he locked the door but there's ways to get past a flimsy little bedroom lock. It was at this point that Edith actually spotted Anthony's mobile phone still sitting on the coffee table in the living room. And she pointed it out and she was like, ha, he won't have been able to call the police. So they knew that Anthony will have just been sitting in that bedroom, just listening to all three of them murder his best friend. And as well, there's the fact that he knew that they'd be coming after him next. Of course, they weren't just gonna leave him alive. So it's the anticipation of waiting for his own death the whole time he's in this bedroom. But anyway, outside, the group are now running around the apartment looking for anything that they can use to get this lock open. And then all of a sudden, one of them found an electric drill. They knew that they could use this drill to physically take the lock off of the door, like take the screws out of the door, get the lock off so they could literally just push it open and get an entry. I actually can't imagine how horrifying this must have been for Anthony who sat inside that room just listening to them, drilling the lock off of the door, knowing what's about to happen to him when they get inside. It's genuinely like something out of a horror movie. I know I say that a lot in these cases and like, I mean, I wonder why, because they are true crime cases, it's all scary. But like this especially, oh my God, the, the intensity of that moment, I can't imagine. As soon as they got that door open, 16 year old Jamie Gray swung it open and ran inside that room with a baseball bat. He started chasing Anthony around the whole room. Anthony managed to get out of the bedroom and now they're chasing him around the whole flat. This whole time, Jamie keeps getting close enough to actually hit him with the baseball bat. So this whole time the chase is going on, he is actually being beaten over and over again. And his physical strength is weakening. This was quite a prolonged ordeal. Apparently this chase was going on for a long time. And after a while, Anthony was actually so badly beaten that he couldn't even run anymore. Like he couldn't even try and get away from Jamie anymore. And so he collapsed. And finally then, Jamie had him on the ground. He could hit him as many times as he needed until he was sure that Anthony Coyle was dead. Anthony suffered the longest and probably most painful death out of all three men that night. And probably the most horrifying experience of the night as well. And once Anthony was dead, the whole group breathed a sigh of relief because this meant that there was no one to tell police what Edith McAllendon had done. All three of them knew that they could get away with this if they were smart about the aftermath. If they were able to get rid of these bodies properly, then they might all get away with this triple murder. But this is the part that John and Jamie didn't want anything to do with. They were gonna leave all of it to his mum, Edith McAllendon, and so John and Jamie just left. Edith didn't get to work straight away. She just kind of sat and let everything dawn on her. She sobered up over the next few hours, and as she did, this the gravity of this situation is just setting in deeper and deeper. She knew that she had to come up with a plan, and that she did. She came up with a plan that she thought was absolutely perfect. The first thing she did was go into the bathroom and clean herself up a little bit. She washed the blood off of her hands. She washed the blood out of her hair. It was everywhere. 
She put on clean clothes, she made herself look as though she had nothing to do with this murder scene, and then she went outside. Her plan was to go and knock on one of the neighbor's doors and pretend as though she'd just come home to find that horrific murder scene in the apartment. So around 3 a.m. on October 17th, 2004, a man named James Sweeney got a knock on his door. He went and opened it to see Edith McCallendon standing in front of him and literally all she said to this man was, something bad happened. She asked him to follow her back to the apartment and he did. Of course, he had no idea what he was about to see. Once he saw the hallway, James said that his stomach was already starting to turn and he hadn't even seen a dead body yet. But just from all the blood all over the walls and the ceiling and the pools of it on the floor, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. Before they even entered the apartment, James told Edith to wait right there with him while he called for police and an ambulance because he didn't want to step foot in that room before help was on the way. So he called up the police and as they made their way down to the scene, he and Edith decided to go into the apartment and have a look around. They made their way into the living room and that was where they saw all three dead bodies. Two of them were laying on the sofas and one of them was just laying on the ground in between them. At this point in time, I think Edith was actually still waiting outside the main door. She hadn't come into the apartment yet. And so James turned around to her and said, please don't come in here. You don't wanna see this. He knew just from looking at all three of these men that they were definitely dead. There was nothing that he could do to save any of them. And so there was no point even trying because all he was gonna do was contaminate the murder scene, contaminate the crime scene. So James turned to Edith and just said, let's wait outside until police arrive. But Edith refused. She saw David Gillespie's body laying on the ground in that apartment and she ran straight over to him. And she was sobbing hysterically. She grabbed his body. She started screaming, wake up, wake up, don't do this to me. She was putting on this full like theatrical performance, hysterical. Literally when the paramedics and police arrived, she still hadn't gotten off him. They had to physically pull her off of David's dead body. She was really going to town on this performance, like. But anyway, paramedics, police, they were there. They got Edith out of the room. They checked all three men's vitals. And of course, all three of them were pronounced dead at the scene. So one of the first things police did was take Edith McCallendon down to the police station for like questioning. More as a witness, not really as a suspect. They weren't suspicious of her. They genuinely believed her story actually. But they just wanted to talk to her really. So they took her to the police station, but we'll get back to that in a second. Because meanwhile, the forensic investigation was taking place back at the apartment. And like I said in the start of the video, Glasgow used to be Europe's murder capital. So the police in that area have seen their fair share of murder scenes, like gruesome murder scenes, but this one really takes the cake. All the police officers that were there that day said that this was the worst crime scene they had ever seen. In their whole time doing that job, this was the most disturbing. It was so bad that it even made senior police officers that had worked on the homicide squad for years, it made them sick. Like they had to leave the apartment to be sick. So one of the first things that police, paramedics, pathologists, or what are they called? Who got, crime scene investigators, them ones. One of the first things crime scene investigators were able to conclude was that this had been a very long, very violent, drawn out ordeal. Like they had been physically fighting for a long time. Because there was blood all over the house, I've already said this, all over the walls, ceiling, floors, pools of it on the floor. It showed that the victims must have been bleeding for a long time and they were running around that house trying to save themselves. Even the bodies of Ian and David were found with Anthony Coyle's blood all over them. From where Anthony had been chased around the apartment, he had been chased around his two dead best friend's corpses. And this told the police that Anthony had been the last to die because of course, Ian and David's bodies must have already been on the floor for him to have been running around and bleeding on. All three of the men's bodies were so badly beaten that police actually described them as almost mashed. Pieces of flesh and bone were actually found on the curtains, like up on the wall, high up in the, uh, the high up on the wall. And this suggested that there must have been some big impact 
attacked with like a big heavy weapon for fragments to have flown that high up on the wall. In fact, these fragments of flesh and bone were later identified as brain and skull fragments of all three men. They'd all been beaten so severely that fragments of all their brains were found around this apartment. This is genuinely one of the most savage murders I've ever heard of. Through the rest of the apartment, police were able to find a whole plethora of weapons that seemed to have been used throughout this attack and all of them were still covered in blood. So I'm just gonna list them all off for you now. There was a hammer, an ax, a baseball bat, golf clubs, knives, metal files, a belt, and some random chunks of wood that seemed to have been used as weapons because they had blood and in some cases chunks of flesh on them. Police actually said about this crime scene that there was so much blood in the flat that it was impossible to be precise about the details of the violence. The blood spatter all over the apartment was analysed but you know like the police said there was that much blood that it's kind of hard to tell. They all blend into one another. But from these blood spatters police were able to conclude that there was more than one person involved in these murders. There was more than one killer they theorized that there was actually three. And because the force used against the three murder victims was so huge, police believed that they were probably looking for male suspects. Male suspects with like a lot of physical strength. But at this point in the case, police were growing a little bit suspicious of Edith McCallendon. I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't a great liar. She wasn't a great actor. And she was starting to raise a few eyebrows. So police were very much under the impression from when they first met Edith McCallendon, you know, when she was like grabbing hold of David's body, sobbing, screaming, screaming like, wake up, wake up, don't leave me. It clearly seemed to police that Edith and David were a thing. You know, they were in a relationship. That's what they believed based on this woman's behavior. And we know that that's true. We know that Edith and David were in fact in a relationship. They had been for years. But why did Edith tell the police that they weren't then? Why did she say that? And we know that that's true. David and Edith were dating and they had been for years, but she told police that they weren't. She told police that they'd never dated and that they were just friends. Why? Police were a little bit wary of that and so they decided to keep digging and that was when they got in contact with one of David's ex-girlfriends named Violet and she gave the tea. Immediately in that phone call, Violet said to police that Edith was lying and that her and David had definitely been together for years and that everyone knew that. Violet herself seemed very upset to hear about what had happened to her ex-boyfriend, David. She said that she knew that Edith McAllendon was not a good person. She was just absolutely horrified and she urged police to actually look into Edith. So it was at this point that police theorized that Edith McAllendon was very much involved in these three murders and that this whole cover story that she just came home and found the apartment like this, it was all a lie. But police didn't think she'd acted alone. They still thought that there were three suspects that they were looking for. Maybe Edith was one of them, but who were the other two people that helped her? Police now needed to identify two more accomplices. Like I said, police actually believed that they were looking for men at this point because they believed just with the strength and the power of all these blows that you know, it had to have been a man. Police tried to get it out of Edith. They tried to ask her in her questionings, but she was not giving anything up. Edith was sticking to her story. And so police had to just try and figure this out a different way. So police knew that Edith and a lot of her friends were homeless or had been homeless at points in their life. They'd bounce between homeless shelters and hostels. So, you know, a good place to start looking is probably the hostels and homeless shelters in that area. So they started getting in contact with all these homeless shelters, all the hostels to arrange interviews, but before they even could, breaking news in the case. Police back at the station had obviously, you know, been working on other parts of this investigation when a man named Brian Gallagher walks in and says that he needs to speak with them. Brian was homeless, living in a shelter in Glasgow, and he came into police to tell them that the night before, John McAllendon had stayed in his homeless shelter and he'd spoken with him. He said that John came stumbling into the shelter like in the early hours of the morning and he was very clearly drunk, but he seemed like he was in good spirits. He seemed like he was in a good mood. It was just like, he was excited about something. So Brian looked over to him and he laughed and he was like, oh, what's got you so happy? And so John turned to Brian and proceeded to tell him exactly what made him so happy. John drunkenly blurted out, 
Stabbed a guy in the legs, man. There was blood everywhere. It was a fella who tried to rape my ma. I had to teach him a lesson and I did my ma's boyfriend. Brian had not expected that to come out of his mouth at all. And now Brian is literally just frozen still. He's so terrified of John McAllender. This man had just confessed to stabbing someone and he said, I did my ma's boyfriend. What does that mean? Does that mean killed? So Brian, like I said, is just frozen there. He doesn't wanna say or do anything because clearly if John is capable of stabbing someone else, he's very clearly capable of stabbing Brian too. But it was clear that John wasn't finished with his story. And so Brian didn't say anything and he just let John carry on telling him about how he just stabbed someone. All the way through this story, John kept referring to someone as my brother, my brother. And Brian was a bit confused because he knew John and he knew that John didn't have a brother. He didn't have any siblings, so he didn't know who this brother was. Anyway, once John was finished telling this story, he just passed out on his bed next to Brian Gallagher's. And Brian was just sat there thinking, what? has just happened. He wasted absolutely no time. He grabbed his bag, packed all his things, and then ran to the police station. Literally, as soon as he walked through that police station door was when he just finished having the conversation with John McAllender. Of course, by the time that Brian got to the police station and told them all of this, they'd already found the murder scene. The investigation was already going on there. But this is how they knew that Brian was telling the truth about this encounter with John McAllender because this case hadn't been on the news yet. It was so fresh that it just hadn't hit the news. So there was no way for Brian to know any of the details of this murder unless he had been told them by the killer himself. And everything that Brian told police that John had said completely matched up with every piece of evidence, you know, how each person was killed. It was all the exact same. So that same day, police went down and arrested 17 year old John McAllendon. And that same day, they also connected his friend, 16 year old Jamie Gray and arrested him as well. Police made all three of these suspects given DNA samples. And these DNA samples were tested against DNA found at the scene and they were all found to be a match. All three of these suspects were the killers. And this was the confirming piece of evidence that police needed to charge all three of them with the murders. And they were to be put on trial in 2005. All three of them decided to plead not guilty to their charges. By the time the trial actually took place, it had been about eight months since the murders actually happened. And none of them, Edith, John and Jamie, had seen each other in that time. Obviously they'd all been kept in separate police custody. And so on this first day of the trial, it was the first time they were all seeing each other again and they were treating this more like a reunion than a murder trial. They were like laughing, smiling, giggling, waving over to each other, like as if they weren't in the same room as their murder victims' families. At the trial, the prosecutor relayed every single little graphic detail about this whole murder. And I'm about to give you a quote of this, so just be aware it is a little bit graphic. He said that the victims had been beaten with knives, metal files, a belt and pieces of wood. They were hit with a bottle, punched, stabbed and stamped on the head and they had boiling water poured all over them. At the trial, the prosecution actually called up a surprise witness that no one knew was gonna be there. It was kind of exciting. And this was the downstairs neighbor of the house of blood. This neighbor took to the stand and told the court that her ceiling was literally shaking that night. With everything that was going on in the apartment above, she likened the noise to like thunder. It was like a thunderstorm up there. They were running, banging. So there was that piece of evidence on top of all the other evidence. And then finally, the jury was shown the police's body cam footage of the first time they stepped foot in the house of blood. So bear in mind in this footage, absolutely nothing was cleared up. The bodies are still there. All the weapons are still there. And the jury, well, everyone in the court sat and watched this full body cam footage. They could see all the blood everywhere. They saw all three bodies still laying there, their brains sweeping across the floor. They were practically mutilated. They were that mauled and beaten. I forgot to say this, but the jury were actually told to prepare themselves for what they were about to see before this video was put on because 
like it's actually it could be a bit traumatizing if you didn't prepare yourself but yeah like i said in this video as the police are walking around you can see all these different weapons just still laying next to the bodies and stuff like that is so eerie and the prosecution actually brought all these weapons into the court with them as well a few of them actually still had chunks of flesh on them. I don't know why they didn't take them off, but they didn't. Also at another point, as this video was playing, the prosecution paused it and pointed out some clumps of hair that were like laying on the floor throughout the apartment. It turns out that this hair was actually Anthony Coyle's and it was theorized by police that it was pulled out as part of this ordeal when he was running away from them. They were trying to grab him and pull him back by his hair. After all this evidence had just been presented to the court, all three suspects actually decided to retract their not guilty plea and instead put out a guilty plea because they knew there was no way they were getting, getting away with this. It's like they saw all that evidence presented in front of them and they were like, yeah, shit, there's actually no way I'm getting away with that. Might as well just plead guilty. But they actually had a plan and I hate to admit this, but this is kind of smart. I think it was their legal teams that advised them to do this. And that was that they decided to split up the charges. Instead of all three of them confessing to all three murders and therefore being triple murderers, they decided to all just confess to one murder each. So Edith McAllendon decided to say, yep, I killed my boyfriend, David Gillespie. And then John McAllendon was like, well, fine, yes, I murdered Ian Mitchell. And then Jamie Gray pipes up and he says, yeah, actually I murdered Anthony Coyle. Realistically, Everyone knows that all three of them murdered all three, like all three of those suspects had a hand in each of those three murders. All three of them work together, but there's no way to argue against it. So like the court just kind of had to accept it because at least they were confessing to the murders. You know what I mean? Like it's something. But this actually worked. For this reason, all three of them ended up getting only slightly shorter sentences than they would have got. Edith was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 13 years, which made her eligible for parole in 2018. I actually don't think she was awarded parole. I couldn't find anything about her status post 2018 online. So who knows, she might still be in there. She might be out now. Let's hope it's the first one. She's 53 years old now, by the way. I don't, don't know where I was planning on putting that in there, but she's 53. John McAllendon and Jamie Gray also both got life sentences. However, their minimum was one year less than Edith's. Hers was 13 and theirs is 12 year minimum. And the reason that Edith got one year more than the boys was supposedly because the judge felt that she was the reason that this all happened. Like if she wasn't there, no one would have lost their lives. As much as John and Jamie are to blame for physically murdering those men, if Edith hadn't called them to come and help, none of it would have happened, you know? Even after they were sentenced, all three of them have just been told they're getting life in prison, by the way. They're all still giggling and joking and, you know, like just having fun with each other. Violet, David Gillespie's ex-girlfriend, if you remember, she said, they go down the stairs laughing as if this whole thing is just a big joke. There's animals on the street that are better than these people. They are scum. So all three of them were sent off to prison. But this case does not stop there because Edith McAllendon had a plan. Cause you know, you kind of got to have a bit of a strategy when you go into prison. I mean, I've never been myself, but I imagine you'd kind of need that. Cause everyone in there is, proper scary and intimidating and violent and like, you know, you gotta have your wits about you in prison. You can't seem vulnerable or as if they can walk all over you. Edith wasn't about to be that girl. She was gonna go in there and show them just how scary and intimidating and powerful she really is. And she decided to do that by bragging about her crimes. She would sit in that jail and tell them all that she is the Edith McAllendon from the House of Blood. You know what I mean? She thought she was a celeb. She thought that making the other women aware of how like scary she is and like what she's capable of, she thought that that would make them so scared that they'd just like do whatever she wanted. But it didn't quite go down that way. Ooh. The other prisoners just like didn't care. <laughs> like they didn't care. Everyone in prison is in prison for bad stuff. Like you can't, like no one was impressed. I don't know, it just didn't really. <laughs> just didn't really go how she wanted it to. In fact, they actually told her to shut up 
on a number of occasions. Like they were getting annoyed with Edith. It got to points where they actually threatened violence. Like if she didn't shut up, they said that they were gonna beat her up. If she didn't stop referring to herself as the woman from the House of Blood. Eventually she settled into prison life and like learned how to be less annoying. But she actually found herself a girlfriend in there who was just as murderous and evil as she is. Pamela Goulet, known as the bedsit butcher, repeatedly slit her neighbor's throat and then left her body slumped behind the door of her bedsit for police to eventually find. Edith and Pamela got into a relationship while they were both in the same prison and I don't know how it ended, but Pamela is now out of prison and she's actually like living her best life. She's got a husband, she's got a new job. I don't know if she's got kids. She might have kids. I know she's got a house, she's got a dog. She's actually just like out there living as if she didn't slit a woman's throat a few years ago. That's insane. But anyway, back to Edith. While she was in jail, and I mean, she probably still is, I don't know. During her time in jail, she and her son, John McAllendon, who is also in jail, they write letters to each other. Quite a lot. And honestly, these letters show how John and Edith actually feel about the murders. Like, they clearly have no remorse. They, d they don't feel bad about what they did. They see this more as an inconvenience to them that they're now like stuck in prison. I've got two quotes from the letters here. One of them said, keep the grin above the chin. And the other one said, we've lost our freedom and gained fuck all, but we keep smiling, so fuck them all. In 2012, Edith was actually given a new cellmate named Anne. Now, Anne was a little bit of like a, she was a little bit vulnerable. She was only in there for like a small theft charge. She wasn't gonna be in long. And for some reason they decided to put her in with a triple murderer. Oh, actually, sorry. She was only found guilty of one murder. But like, we know, we come on, we know. Come on, we know what happened. So they put this quite anxious, vulnerable girl in a cell with Edith McAllendon and Edith just, chews this girl up and spits her out. She started to manipulate and abuse Anne. She treated her like a slave. She like would like blackmail her and threaten her to do anything she wanted. She would steal all of Anne's medication. She would steal her money so that Edith could take it to the shop and buy stuff with it. Like she was awful to Anne. Anne said that she lived in constant fear of violence throughout that whole jail stay. All because of her cellmate. It wasn't the fact that she was in jail, it was the fact that she was with Edith McAllendon. As for John McAllendon, he just kept his head down in prison and was actually so well behaved that he got let out early in 2016. So it's only a year early, but you know. Shortly after his release, John met a woman named Lauren Cassidy and he fell head over heels for her and the two of them quickly started dating. And John was very open about his past, about, you know, the murders with Lauren and she was willing to put his past behind him. She believed that John was a changed man and that, you know, he had his reasons for doing what he did back then. As was mentioned before in that quote that he said to, was it Brian Gallagher, the guy in the shelter? He said something about someone raping his mother. I don't want to brush past that, but that is genuinely all I read about that online. So I don't know if that was a thing. I don't know if that was just something that John said to justify the murders or if that was actually something that happened, but either way, don't know. Anyway, that was a complete tangent. Sorry, uh, John's now met Lauren. She's completely okay with his past. They're in a good relationship for a while, but it doesn't last. This relationship, very quickly became toxic and abusive. On John's end, John was the manipulative, abusive one. And it started out small, but then it just spiraled out of control until it all came to a head in July of 2018. One day, John and Lauren were spotted together arguing in Glasgow city center at 1 a.m. The person that spotted this decided to stick around and watch for a little bit longer just to see what happened here and he actually ended up witnessing John kicking Lauren repeatedly. He was screaming at her saying, get out of my fucking way, you bitch. So the person that saw this called the police, they came down and unfortunately Lauren didn't want to press charges against John and so nothing ever happened from this. I don't know if John and Lauren are still together today. I genuinely couldn't find that anywhere. I hope for her sake that they're not because he has clearly shown that he's just not changed. He is just as much of a violent man as he was the day that he murdered three people. He is never gonna change. Men like this don't change. People, abusive people like this do not change. So if you find yourself in a relationship like Lauren Cassidy, please, 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 
get out of there. Please get some help. I'll leave some numbers in the description. But yeah, that is everything for this case. Thanks again to our sponsors, Magellan TV. And remember, right now, when you buy one gift card for an annual membership, you'll get another one completely free. All you have to do is go through the link down below in the description of this video. A huge, huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting me and helping decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you wanna become a channel member, you can click the link to do so in the description or you can click the join button if you're on a desktop. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you'll probably also enjoy this one too. I'm gonna pick one out specially for you. There you go, there you go, there you go. Or you can subscribe because you'll like all the other stuff I do too. Anyway, bye.